and welcome to our next episode of Cyber Tangent, where we will be discussing cross-department communication challenges. We are honored to have Larry Whiteside join us today. Larry, how are you? I am wonderful. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. So Larry is an established leader in the cybersecurity industry. He's served as CISO for a number of years and uh, a number of organizations. He's currently CISO of Greenway Health and heads up Whiteside Security. Larry is also the co-founder of a not-for-profit called ICMCP, the International Consortium of Minority Cybersecurity Professionals. It is geared toward increasing the number of minorities and women represented in the cybersecurity space. Larry is a recognized expert and speaker and published writer on all things cyber and technology risk management. And if I can point out, Larry, I, I did notice in doing a little personal research on you, you are a, a published writer of a blog t- entitled Power of a Frank Conversation, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. So are you prepared for a frank conversation about the challenges of cross-department communications in cyber? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I've lived it for a long time. Okay. <laughs> Let's go then. So let me start it off by just observing. It seems like whenever we talk to anyone outside of cyber, maybe that even includes the IT teams, we often find that there's a very low level of awareness of what the cyber team actually does all day. How would you say, how would you characterize the awareness of cybersecurity, its activities, and its value to the organization? So the value to the organization is growing immensely, right? Just because the publicity of the breaches that have happened and the number of them increasing every year, the number of records being breached every year and and all of those types of things. But the interesting point you bring up is what cybersecurity does all day. Because a lot of people don't really understand the operations of cyber and what it takes to actually run a cybersecurity program. Cyber grew up in IT, right? It started as network security, so to speak, back in the early 90s. Uh, People look at at this thing called cybersecurity today and don't really truly understand it. And from a cyber standpoint, we don't do a good job actually educating them on who we are and what we do, right? We talk to the business and we talk to everybody inside the corporation about what their responsibility is. We educate them on how to be better stewards, right? Sure. And how to be better aware as it relates to cybersecurity. But none of that really deals with what are the tasks and what are the, the what's the nuances of the things that the teams do on a daily basis to actually keep the company safe. And for that reason, right, you never hear anybody praising cybersecurity when things are going great, mm-hmm. right? Point. You, you only point. hear them saying when things go wrong, what did you do? What did you not do? Why did this happen? Yeah, no, I've seen that too. So history can be important here. And you, you just highlighted that you you grew up in the InfoSec industry. Help us to understand, give us a little historical uh, context, if you will, about where IT and where security have come from, and then if you can go into the, their contributions to the current cyber challenges we see in typical organizations today. Yeah, so part of the problem is, is where we came from. So the entire space of cyber started in IT, as I stated before, right? It was a network security function. And unfortunately, what that causes today is that still causes most of the business and most of the organization, for that matter, to look at cyber, the cybersecurity leaders and the cybersecurity staff as technologists and look at them as an offshoot of IT. And the reality is that could be farthest from the truth, as data has become more important and become the linchpin for everything that companies do, both from a technology standpoint and just from an information standpoint. Cyber has taken on all aspects and moved away from just being technologists to being more data stewards, right? Okay. Our job is to really ensure that from a data standpoint, we are protecting the organization and ensuring that the right people have the right access at the right time. Okay. No, that helps. You mentioned yourself earlier, Larry, that the profile of the security team is increasing all the time. And it certainly seems that the communication span and the communication profile of the head of security, the CISOs of the world, is expanding all the time. No longer are they just responsible for communicating to themselves, for instance, right? So give us a give us an understanding of what we what you've seen within organizations as far as who the CISO is expected to communicate to, and then what are some of the trends? What will we see over the next five to ten years? 
Yeah, so so this is really dependent upon the maturity of the organization because it really spans the gambit. You have some organizations who are not very mature where the CISO is still very a very IT-centric person, and their only responsibility is to report technology-based metrics to the CIO or whoever the, the leader of the technology function is. But the mature organizations have taken it a huge leap further. I won't even call it a step because it's a leap. Mm, okay. And thanks to outside organizations like the NACD, the National Association of Corporate Directors, um, they are now putting the onus on boards and the senior executive staff or the executive leadership teams to take some ownership and accountability as it relates to an organization's cybersecurity program, right? No longer can the board or the executive team put their head in the sand and say they didn't know, they weren't aware, right? They now have to ask questions. They now need to be informed. So the mature organizations, right, are really directly providing information that shows how cybersecurity is impacting the bottom line to an organization. Over the next five to 10 years, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see that expand. Right now, there's a very small percentage of organizations that have reached that level of maturity. Mm. Most organizations fall right now into into either an infrastructure or compliance-based cybersecurity model where they are focusing on the technology infrastructure that supports the business and, and securing that really hard and reporting on their ability or inability to do that, or they are reporting on compliance-based metrics that help them meet whatever the compliance and regulatory governing bodies are. And that's not bad, but as they mature, they've got to grow past that to be able to openly identify risks that impact things outside of just IT infrastructure, outside of just a regulatory requirement, but adding in a company's bottom line and the business. Okay, let me run with that for a second. I'm looking for your perspective. And if we just look at a global 2000 companies, the typical global 2000 company, if one end of the spectrum is compliance-based, checklist-minded communication and approach to cyber. And the other end of the spectrum is being able to effectively communicate the impact of cybersecurity on the company's bottom line. On one side, it's a one. On the other side, it's a 10. Where is your typical global 2000 company right now? The global 2000s are typically right in the middle, uh, probably between a four and a six, depending on what their business is, right? So... Healthcare is getting better. They're not completely there yet. Healthcare is getting better, but the global 2000 healthcare are definitely driving some of it. Financial services is closer to a 10, right? They've got the revenue, they've, they've got the resources. Mm-hmm. So they are actually having that conversation. So it really depends on the vertical, but the majority of that level of businesses, the global 2000 would be probably closer mm-hmm. to a six. Okay, so back to the spirit of the frank conversation. You are... Seated around a table, Larry, with four of your good friends who are all CISOs, what's your advice to them as far as their need to be accountable and responsible for this communication? So it's funny you ask this because I literally just had a dinner with probably eight CISOs around the table a week ago. And, you know, as part of our conversation, this is always it. It's about what we say, leveling up the conversation, taking the conversation from the tactical conversation, taking it beyond just the business conversation and taking it to a risk based conversation that can be quantified similar to how you quantify risk from a financial perspective. Those are the things that get the board and the executive leadership team's attention and get their eye, because if you can show and help quantify how cyber is going to potentially impact the business and the bottom line and that business is trying to generate from from a revenue standpoint, that's what gets their attention. Because ultimately, every leadership team is graded and, and measured on EBITDA, they're mm-hmm. graded and measured on business growth, and, and they're graded and measured on risk management and mitigation, right? And so a lot of the organizations focus a lot on financial risk to the organization. Cyber is just now becoming part of that conversation. And so when I talk with other CISOs, we are talking very heavily about leveling up the conversation and making sure that the organization sees us as 
business leaders yeah. and not technologists. I like that leveling up the conversation. Okay, so the title of our podcast, the name of our podcast is Cyber Tangent. We like to go on tangents on occasion. Let me take us on a, on a brief tangent. We've been focusing so far on the CISO outward. Let's flip that around a little bit and talk for a moment about the organization towards the CISO or the security team, the security leader. What are the standard expectations that an organization can expect to have and place upon the CISO, his or her organization, and their communication outwards? Yeah, so that's a good question. So this is part of the problem. A lot of organizations are hiring people into the CISO role without really knowing what to expect. So, and, and they hire them because the person can, they know the lingo, they can talk, they can talk at, at certain levels and they talk in ways that make it seem as if they understand the industry. The reality is an organization, if they want to measure the value a CISO is going to bring to them, they need to understand what the CISO's model is going forward to take the organization forward and bring the cybersecurity program forward. Is the CISO going to be a business-focused leader? Are they going to be someone who goes out and one of their, if you ask a CISO for their 30, 60, 90-day plan, that in their first 30, 30 or 60 days, part of that is not building credibility and building relationships with the business leaders across the company, they're going to fail, right? And they're going to fail because they are not going to, they're not going to incorporate and put the business as the paramount thing that they're trying to support and accomplish. The reality is successful CISOs walk into every organization and they say, I am not a stopgap. I am not an officer. No, mm -hmm. I am a business enabler. Mm -hmm. My job is to help you accomplish your goals securely. So they should be, every CISO that walks into an organization, the organization should expect them to be going around to all aspects of the business, trying to identify what the business's short and long-term goals are and having open transparent conversations on how they can do that securely. Understanding that you can't get to, you can't get from zero to 10 overnight yeah. and finding a way to find that happy medium and discuss with the business, what are the risks identify, what are the risks that they bring up and can identify in getting to 10 and what, how can they stage getting there and what are they willing to accept from a risk standpoint? Because a lot of CISOs just don't talk and have those types of conversations and because of that, they get deemed as the office of no. You guys, the security only tell us what we can't do. And those are the CISOs that are failing their organization. The office of no. <laughs> okay, so so this is, a, you're giving me such great inspiration for questions, Larry. This is easy for me. You were talking about zero to 10 and the different competencies. We like to oversimplify things by saying there's people, process, and technology. So let's continue to oversimplify it that way. If I'm an organizational leader, a CEO or a board member, and I need to select the CISO to take me to the next level. If you were that person and you had 10 points to spread between people expertise, process expertise, and technology expertise for your next CISO, how are you going to spread those 10 points? And realizing that you can't split them and 10 doesn't separate evenly by three. <laughs> do, do you follow the question? Right. Yeah, no, I do. Absolutely. So honestly, process is going to be weighted heavier than anything. Because no matter how much technology you throw at a problem, technology is not the answer. It's the answer in some cases, but in more cases, process is a better answer. And so I'm probably going to throw five at process. I'm then going to throw uh, three at people because having smart people who can think outside the box, right? I like to use the analogy of if you go back to the days when we were in math and the, and the teacher taught you how to solve a problem in a certain way. Sure. The reason they used to always ask you to show your work was because there were a number of teachers who didn't care how you got to the answer. As long as you could show that you methodically thought through and, and demonstrated how you got to the answer and you didn't guess and you didn't cheat, they were fine with it. And if you hire smart people, you can get people who do that, right? And then what that gives you is that thinking outside the box will enable you to build better processes. It'll enable you to build better governance capabilities. And then where you can't have a process, where you can't, where that it doesn't exist and you need to put technology in place, that's when you do it. But technology shouldn't be the first go-to. Technology should be the, there's no other way for us to accomplish this better mm -hmm. and more efficiently than putting a piece of technology in place. 
Okay, so I got the five on process, and then did you do three on technology and two on people? Or how, how did no, you? No, I did, I did three on people and two on technology. Three on people, two on technology. Okay. Technology, te- technology has got to stop being our go to answer for every problem. Sure. We've got to go back and look at, right, if we have smart people inside of our organizations and we look at how are we doing business, are there ways for us to, are, can we build better processes? Sometimes this technology is going to be the foundational part of that. But we shouldn't look at technology first. And I will say 100%, the change of technology over the last 20 years with AI and all of the speed to which processing has happened these days, technology can sometimes be the thing that supplements process. But unfortunately, in cyber, we sometimes go to technology first when we should be focusing on processes. Because if you think, a conversation we've been having in cyber for a long time now is Get the basics, cybersecurity 101. I've written blogs and and had articles and magazines and everything about cybersecurity 101. Here we are 20 plus years into our business of cybersecurity, and yet IT still doesn't do asset management properly. Mm -hmm. We still don't have good change management that cybersecurity is integrated into. Like So some of the base process things that aren't technology-based, they are just process things, patch management. These things are still not being done well. And so if I, I have routinely said on stage and on every platform I can get on, if we focus and get some of the base processes well, we'll actually sure up what our industry is trying to do by leaps and bounds. But constantly going down this path of throwing technology at every problem is getting us into this world of shelfware, mm-hmm. where every organization is overloaded with technology and has more technology than they know what to do with, and some of it ends up sitting on the back burner. Okay, one more question in our tangent as we focus on the organization trying to select and groom the very best CISO. So you said five process expertise, three people expertise, and two technology expertise is an optimal makeup for the CISO. If I'm that hiring board member, how much of a disconnect am I seeing between your optimal breakdown and the pool of top candidates that I have to select from? With respect to their background, their training, and their mindset. Oh, it's it's a large it's a large breakdown right now. I mean, there are so part of the problem is there's no training plan. There's no there's no career path, a direct career path on how to be a CISO. CISO is really being a good CISO. If you talk to guys who are at the Fortune 100, the Fortune. 500 who mm-hmm. are good CISOs, it's been trial and error over their career. Mm-hmm. And every one of them, for the most part, have been doing this for well over 15 years, right? It's been trial and error. And because of that, because there is no direct training plan, there's no exact way. SANS has their thing, and you've got a number of people that, that have this CISO certification and, and CEH, and all, right? But the reality is, is trial by fire is the only thing that really gets CISOs to the point of understanding the capability. I know many organizations, understanding the capabilities they need. I know many organizations who have hired people out of the, what I'll say, the the, the big four, or big five, however you want to categorize sure. these days, right? Who theoretically as consultants or partners, right, seemed extremely well as they sat outside the organization and helped an organization. Mm-hmm right? Achieve something from a cyber standpoint, achieve some aspect of maturity in their cyber program. And they've then hired these people in who have been career consultants, so to speak, or in a big four or big five type firm, right? But been outside the day-to-day operational running and breathing of a cybersecurity program and they get in and fail. Yeah. And they get in and fail because the nuances of being a CISO, there is nothing that completely documents and trains you on how to deal with all those things other than trial by fire. And so many organizations are dealing with that and not everybody can overcome them. And it's, it's only through collaboration. I talk with a number of CISOs on a regular basis, both through LinkedIn, both through direct text, both through, through dinners in different parts of the country where I'm sitting down with my peers and we're having full open, transparent Vegas rules type conversation. Right. Because the reality is, is we, recognize that we are only going to get better through sharing with each other and being able to take back lessons learned from this consortium, so to speak, of others who are dealing with stuff. 
And unfortunately, as more people, more regulations are requiring CISOs be in place in certain organizations, and organizations are just appointing them. I know organizations who have appointed the general counsel as their CISO. Can they, are they actually <laughs> serving as a CISO in reality? No. Yeah. They have a time. Yeah. There, are, there are places that have appointed their firewall admin because he knew security better than anybody else as their CISO. Is that person really performing as a CISO? No. But now they have the title, and because the organization had no, they had no way to know what their expectations should be of a person in that role, the person sits there and they fail. I have heard a great saying that goes something like, smart people learn from their experience. Wise people learn from others, other people's experience and foolish people just don't learn. You, 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 see so type, you see so types are famous, you truly are, for learning from each other. And you painted a beautiful picture of you sitting around the table with eight other CISOs. Let's jump out of the organization back to shining the focus on the communication gaps that the CISO is facing. You're around that table. If we just get down to basic communication tactics, what makes the top three or top five list? as you're sharing notes amongst your peers to facilitate communication between the security initiatives and the rest of the organization? So number one is truly showing that you care what business leaders care about, right? And what does that mean? That means getting involved. That means sometimes maybe quarterly you participate in their staff meetings, right? Yeah. Getting involved with the business leaders to show that you care about what they're doing and you can truly understand what they're doing and what they're trying to achieve is one of the biggest things that will get them on your side as you begin having conversations with them around the identification and mitigation of risk based on what they're trying to accomplish, right? Because letting them know that you care shows that you are in it with them and that you're not an adversary to them. You're not there to mm -hmm. stop them from doing anything. You're there to help them, to enable them to meet their goals in a secure way and to really save them time, money, and resources from having to do it differently later or deal with the impact, a breach or incident because it wasn't done properly, right? Yes, You're not sir. there. You know, I've actually seen some business leaders who, who have said to me, yeah, the former guy who was in this role was just more of a tattletale. He basically just went to, mm -hmm. never had conversation with us Right. Well, they, they would hear things that we were doing and they would literally go to, you know, the business leaders boss or go to a committee, a compliance committee or some sort of audit board or, or some audit committee of some sort. And basically say the business is trying to do this and, and they can't do that. That's not fostering a good relationship. Right. You have to really look at the relationship that you as a CISO have with these business leaders. As like these these people, not that you have to be best friends with them, but you got to show them that you care. So that's number one. Number two, you then have to be transparent. So as they're sharing things with you, I've seen CISOs fail because they go back and instead of being transparent and saying, well, the direction you're going, I get and I understand. I don't necessarily agree. I don't agree with this, how you're getting there. Can I help show you some ways that will get you there more securely. They actually, in turn, sit there and listen to like, and they almost beat down the business leaders to make them feel like the decisions that they're making are just are just stupid, and that that you know this should be common sense that you're doing that you're doing it the way I'm telling you, and not that way because the way you're doing it makes no sense. Regardless of how good a relationship you build, if, if you belittle somebody or make them feel like what they're doing that. Make them feel out like the position they, they did is stupid or dumb or, or just makes no sense from a common sense standpoint. They're going to build animosity and they're going to start going around you, sure. right? Sure, sure. And then lastly, the third one I would say is that taking that transparency to what you do and what you ask of them, right? Because a lot of CISOs don't go in and set their expectation for the business leaders, right? Okay, tell me what you're doing, Right. And give me give me your thoughts on how I can help, right? And as you take that in, then talk to them about what they can do to help you and be transparent about it and talk about, here are the governance things that I'm going to put in place to make sure we're doing the things we say we're doing. As we agree to these standards, here are some of the things that I want to measure against to make sure we're doing it. And I'll talk with you before I report this to the board, right? I'll give you as a business leader an opportunity to see, visualize, because there's 
this is leaders. There is nothing more painful than being put on the spot in front of sure. your bosses or the board and not having had any visibility into what's being shown. It is, I've watched it happen as an advisor mm. to CISOs, and I've been part of the conversations on the back end after the, the business leader was sitting there sweating at the board meeting. And it's not pretty? Is that what you're going to tell us, Larry? No, no, <laughs> it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. So I heard care about the mission of the business, transparency, clear expectations. Absolutely. That's all right. Can you talk for a moment about frequency of communication? Yeah, so that is really, it's really business dependent, right? So a lot of organizations are meeting heavy. A lot of them are not. So I think as it relates to your business leaders, you should at a minimum, once a quarter, be having a one-on-one with them. In between that, as you come up with what your, I'll say, measuring stick is for the health of your program, as it relates to their different businesses and what they're doing, you should be communicating that with them on a monthly basis, right? But then at least once a quarter, there should be a face-to-face, and that face-to-face can be, it can be in whatever medium you want, but there should be some aspect of a direct one-to-one conversation of the things that have happened over the last three months Mm -hmm. so that the conversation, because typically board meetings are happening, you know, once or twice a year, unless you're in smaller technology companies. But for most of the Fortune 2000, it's once or twice a year that the board is meeting. And the most likely quarterly metrics are what's being asked of the CISO. And so sitting down and with each of those business leaders at that frequency, I think is what will give them the level of comfort that you're engaged and are, you know, care about what they're doing. But again, it's very, very business and industry specific because I was, I was CSO of one organization that had a board meeting every other month. Yeah. So okay. it, it really depends. So I'm going to give you a magic wand, Larry, and your magic wand enables you to wave it over your leadership team and have them know one thing as a fact about your security organization that you think will make everything a lot smoother from a communication standpoint. What are you going to change about what they know or what fact are you going to have them just know about the security team? So the one fact that I would hope that they knew in hiring me because I communicated, but the, the one thing that I would make sure that they always knew and always had front of mind was that in every decision that I am making as it relates to cybersecurity, I am A, communicating it, collaborating about it and taking the business needs as a top priority as it relates to risk. Okay. Follow-up question. What percentage of time do you think that that sentiment is understood going into conversations? (laughs) I think very rarely. So it's funny you ask that. So one of the things I did at one organization when I joined the organization And as part of the orientation, they had the leadership team come in and sit down and you could talk to them and just ask them questions. And so for me, sitting in this orientation, I wanted to know what the term cybersecurity, what was the first thing that came to their mind individually for each one of them? Interesting. Right. And I asked that because that term cybersecurity has so many potential definitions based on who you are. But I wanted to use that because that is then the framework with which I based my one-on-one conversation with them. So after the orientation, when I went to have my one-on-one with each of them, I walked in with my notes and I had their name and I had what their response to that question was. And I framed my conversation around that and dove into it. And then walking out of that made sure that they understood where I was and what my goals were as related to cybersecurity for the organization. So in hopes that next time that question is answered by each of them, that they actually had the ability to articulate the same thing. And I will bring it back up at each one-on-one that I have on a quarterly basis. It'll be part of the first five minutes of our conversation. I like that a lot. It sounds like you might have some therapist training in your background, maybe, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. Okay, so, so as, we wrap, as we get towards our, our final questions, I have two more questions. 
for our security leaders and our security team members out there and, and even participants within the within organizations, help us understand some signs that will be popping up when communication is not working well between the security team and the organization. What are some signs of dysfunction there? Yeah, some signs of dysfunction are literally when anytime you ask for anything, right, whether it be budget, whether it be resources, whether it be just general questions about the business, the response is why, right? So if you are having to justify at every turn any question you have as it relates to getting more involved, adding resources to do more and support more, then communication is not working. And you are either not communicating enough or the communication that you are doing is not getting the proper message across. So it's almost like the foundation of trust or the communication framework just isn't there in that case. Yeah, it's just not there because... That if you're constantly being asked why, that means A, they don't know what you're doing they don't, or they don't understand it. And they don't understand how that applies to the business. Because most of the time when you're asking for more resources, that means the threat has increased or the needs of the business have increased that are driving you to do more from a cyber standpoint. And so that should be pretty clear in communication as a business, you work with the business and they communicate these things to you. You should be communicating up, right? right? You've got your overall strategy to support your strategy. You've got these technical goals that you must must reach. And you've got these tactical projects that end up happening, right, in order to support the business. Well, as those projects grow or as, as the number of projects grow, the reality is, is there should be some open communication about those things that is happening on a regular basis. And so if that communication is not happening, right, or it's not the message isn't getting across clearly, People are going to constantly ask why. why. That makes sense. Final question. Let's just flip that one around. What are some signs that communication is working well within the organization? When, when the organization actually comes to you to be part of the decision framework. So every organization, right, has got a strategy. Every organization is trying to figure out how to be better at what they do. And with that comes, there's a lot of conversations and a lot of decisions. And at times, when a strategic decision is made, at some point in time, sometimes you have to pivot as an organization because either it's not going well or something's changed in the market. If at that pivot point or any pivot point or even the inception of a strategy, they come to include you to ensure you are part of the conversation and decision tree, that's when you know a conversation is going. It, communication is happening because they recognize who you are. They recognize what your, what your team is and the value that your team brings to the organization and its success moving forward. Larry, this has been a great conversation. Thank you for jumping into this with us and helping us explore and tackle the cross-department communication challenges between the security team and the rest of the organization. Practical, helpful, powerful Larry, I really appreciate your help today. No problem. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity.